Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Rhonda Rosen, and I am the programming and exhibitions librarian here at Hannon Library. On behalf of our entire outreach team, I would like to welcome you to virtual faculty pub night. Um, tonight's special guest is Kate Pickert, uh, an assistant professor of English in LMU's Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts here at LMU. And she is going to discuss with the book, Radical, the Science, Cultural and History of Breast Cancer in America. So, hi Kate. So I would like to remind you all that Faculty Pub Night is the library's opportunity to spotlight our amazing faculty accomplishments. And we'd like to show them off to the community and beyond. So please tell your friends and have them join us once a month. Um, before we get to our speakers, let's go over the ground rules for tonight. So uh, before I introduce our speaker, um, we, I want you to know that we will be recording this evening's presentation and it will be available shortly on the uh, library's YouTube channel, probably in a day or so. After the presentation, uh, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, you are welcome to submit your questions during the presentation by using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Um, all questions will be compiled and by our outreach team and then submitted to the speaker as time permits. So without further ado, um, before joining the journalism faculty at LMU, Kate Pickert was a staff writer for Time Magazine where she wrote cover stories and other features about healthcare, politics, California, and trends in modern American life. Professor Pickert was the script editor of Time's 2011 Emmy Award-winning oral history project, Beyond 9-11. She won a New York Press Club Award for her coverage of the Affordable Care Act and her 2012 cover story on the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade won the News Women's Club of New York Award for Best Magazine Feature Story. Before Time, she wrote for New York Magazine, Bon Appetit, Outside and a variety of other magazines and newspapers. She's a graduate of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Radical is Kate's first book and it was named an editor's choice by the New York Times, which called the text an even-handed, powerful and unflinching page turner, which I can attest to. The Washington Post called the book, quote, a remarkably unflinching and clear-eyed examination of scientific and cultural progress and failure centered on a disease once only whispered about, now ballyhooed in marches and merchandise. So I am happy to wake, welcome Kate Pickard to talk about her battle against breast cancer and how she came to write about it in her book, Radical the Science, Culture, and History of Breast Cancer in America. Welcome, Kate. Um, thank you so much for having me. And thanks uh, to um, Rhonda and Carol um, and the rest of the uh, library staff um, for putting this event together and for just doing the pub night series under such, um, uh, under such challenging um, circumstances. Um, so before I um, talk a little bit about, and I just wanna make sure, am I in the, in the screen properly? Because on my screen, I see um, Rhonda's avatar. Am I okay, Rhonda? Okay, great. Um, okay, so before I talk a little bit um, about the book, I wanted to um, explain a little bit about how the project uh, came to be. Um, so as um, Rhonda said in her introduction, um, when I was, uh, before coming to LMU, I joined the faculty in the fall of 2015. This is my book. Um, I joined the faculty in the fall of 2015, but this project really had its origins um, uh, in what happened in my own life about a year earlier. Um, so I just want to give you some context um, for sort of who I was uh, when I sort of became a breast cancer patient and then decided to undertake a project about it. So as Rhonda mentioned, I was a staff writer at Time Magazine, and I wrote about lots of different issues for Time. I was really fortunate um, to be able to tackle lots of different subjects. Um, I wrote about abortion, um, mindfulness, which was a learning experience, um, politics. This is our, our mayor, Eric Garcetti. Um, but mostly I wrote about federal health care policy. 
Um, so in uh, shortly after Obama came into office, I was assigned to cover federal health care policy as it became clear that President Obama planned to push through a big overhaul of the federal health care system. Um, so I wrote about um, in the insurance business, um, legislation, uh, the history of the American health care system, um, who gets left behind in the system, how uh, insurance policies can sometimes dictate our health, um, and other really important issues, including even um, the rise of the Tea Party movement um, as it related to um, Obama's push for um, federal health care. And I even occasionally wrote about breast cancer um, as a staff writer for Time. This is a story um, I co-wrote with a colleague in 2009 about uh, sort of the complicated data around um, breast cancer screening. Um, I wrote a couple of stories um, about Angelina Jolie when she went public with having a preventive um, double mastectomy. Um, and so these experiences were wonderful. Um, I learned uh, so much about how federal health care policy happens, et cetera. Um, but what I didn't learn about through all of my reporting and writing was the patient experience. Um, I didn't speak to a lot of patients. I talked to a lot of politicians and policymakers in Washington. And I wasn't even a science writer um, by training. Um, I wrote about sort of the big picture of American healthcare um, and not so much the small picture, what it's like to actually be in the system. And then in the fall of 2014, I myself was diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma, otherwise known as breast cancer. I was only 35 years old. I was a mother to a three-year-old little girl um, and I had no family history of breast cancer. So the diagnosis came as a complete shock to me as I think it probably does to anyone who's diagnosed with breast cancer, but particularly anyone um, as young as I was in my um, mid thirties. Um, I had a pretty good case of breast cancer, not good in the good sense, but a pretty aggressive case of breast cancer. I had two um, invasive tumors in my breast and it had spread to my lymph nodes already. And so as this news was coming to me and doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment, I was of course terrified um, and uh, very fearful about the future and what was to come. But I was a journalist, and so I leveraged really my journalism skills to learn as much as I could about my diagnosis, about the healthcare that was available to me here in Los Angeles. And before long, I would say within just a couple of weeks of my diagnosis, in a lot of ways, my fear and terror about my diagnosis gave way to another emotion that is very familiar to all journalists, which is curiosity. I just wanted to know more and more and more. And like most 30-something um, women, um, a lot of my notions about what breast cancer is and what it's like to have it had been shaped um, not by personal experience, but by what I had seen um, and through popular media. Um, celebrities who got breast cancer and appeared bald on the cover of uh, People magazine, um, breast cancer depicted in movies and television. I was, of course, um, aware of the pink ribbon and um, Komen's Race for the Cure, and sort of these kinds of um, ideas and um, things that existed in society around breast cancer. Um, so I thought I had some understanding of what this experience might be like. But once I entered uh, what many breast cancer, many cancer patients refer to as cancer land, once I was really in the system and beginning um, to uh, think about treatment, um, and as I was sort of leveraging my journalistic skills to learn as much as I could about the illness, I realized that what I thought I understood about breast cancer was really a mirage and that the real story of breast cancer was far more complicated and far more interesting. Um, for example, these are just a few of the things I learned in the two weeks after my diagnosis. Um, one, I would get chemotherapy, but I would not lose my hair, which was shocking to me. Um, uh, I learned that mammography is useless for most women my age. I had a mammogram and it actually missed my cancer, uh, which was later confirmed through an MRI. Um, I learned that uh, the American healthcare system finds a lot of breast cancer these days. Um, we do a ton of screening, obviously, and any um, women in the audience uh, over 40 probably familiar with the annual mammogram um, or maybe every other year um, mammography. But even though we're finding a lot of early breast cancer these days, the mortality rate is not plunging in the way that we kind of hoped it would. Um, the mortality rate is decreasing uh, for breast cancer, but very slowly. Um, despite all of our all of our best efforts. Um, I also learned a lot of sort of quirky facts that I really wanted to know more about. For example, I learned that this tree, which is a Pacific yew tree, 
um, is where the uh, one of the main chemotherapy drug I would be treated with um, was first discovered in the bark of this tree um, in the Pacific Northwest, which was just fascinating to me. So there were all these little stories I kind of stumbled upon while trying to learn more um, about my illness. Um, and that's not all. <laughs> um, I also learned uh, about the history of breast cancer surgery and that women have been getting mastectomies for probably thousands of years and certainly before the invention of anesthesia, which I found to be fascinating. I learned that men get breast cancer. Um, and in fact, more men die of breast cancer every year than testicular cancer, which was something I most certainly didn't know before. And astonishingly, um, I learned that the um, form of breast cancer I had was extremely aggressive, but also highly survivable, only because of a relatively new drug um, that almost never came to market. Um, and if I had been diagnosed with the same type of breast cancer just 15 years earlier, I certainly, most certainly would have died. Um, and then finally, I learned that if I had been diagnosed even one year earlier, when I probably had breast cancer but did not know, um, I would have had a different and possibly less effective course of treatment because of another drug that had come to market. So in this weird way, I started asking myself these questions like, did not knowing that I had breast cancer save my life? Um, and sort of provocative questions like that that popped into my mind and that I, I knew that other breast cancer patients must also ask themselves these questions. But for some reason, uh, these sorts of questions and insights never really um, sort of rose to the level of public consciousness. Instead, we, we see the bald heads and pink ribbons and sort of these familiar images and notions, even though the story is a lot more complicated and I thought uh, much more interesting. And there was one final thing that I learned in the first couple of weeks that was especially heartening, which was even though I would undergo more than a year of treatment, including um, a double mastectomy, lymph node removal, chemotherapy, targeted drug therapy, radiation, um, I would most likely, uh, according to my doctors, be able to continue to work. Um, and actually I would be able to, because, um, because I would be able to keep my hair through chemo, I could keep my disease private if I chose. And this was especially heartening to me because um, my first interview to be a professor at LMU had been previously scheduled and it was scheduled for the day after my diagnosis. So this meant that I would go through the sort of gauntlet that one goes through to uh, uh, get a tenure track job at a, at a great university like LMU, which is a series of interviews uh, in person with many people. I would go through that process while I was in chemotherapy, um, but I could keep my disease at least at that stage um, to myself and to, to private. Um, and I also knew that I would begin teaching while I was still in treatment. So learning all of this was so fascinating. It just really exploded a lot of the previous notions um, I had about breast cancer. And my experience as a journalist had taught me, you know, sort of how to find facts and evidence, but also had taught me uh, something that many, most journalists are aware of, which is that facts and evidence don't really increase our understanding without understanding the story around them and sort of the history and the context. And so I wanted to know that story. So even as I was entering into my treatment, I felt like I really wanted to know the story of breast cancer. Um, how we got here, how my treatment sort of came to be. And I searched for a book that would explain this to me. Um, uh, I wanted to know the narrative behind it. I wanted to know how we got here, how the science happened, who did it, uh, why breast cancer is so misunderstood even today, and how, why for so much breast cancer awareness that we have, uh, most people are, are not aware of just many of the basic uh, fundamental facts about the disease. And I found that no such book existed to my surprise. Um, so there are many um, breast cancer memoirs on the market and many books about sort of how to get through treatment and books that offer advice. Um, but no journalist had really tried to tackle the subject in any kind of comprehensive way in a couple of decades. And I was also acutely aware of the fact that if I, as a national healthcare reporter, was learning so many um, fascinating things about science and the patient experience, didn't this expose an enormous knowledge gap in public understanding? And this was especially notable because breast cancer is so common, right? I'm sure everyone in the audience here today, I mean, you've, you've come to a talk about breast, a book about breast cancer, so you, you probably already have a built-in interest. But even if you uh, aren't at this talk, um, you know, chances are you know someone who's had breast cancer. So it is a disease that in some small and sometimes small, sometimes large ways really touches 
everyone and all of us. And if we could better understand this disease, wouldn't it give us a better understanding of larger um, topics and issues like how the healthcare system works? Um, what does it mean to be a woman in the healthcare system? Um, why is science so messy and yet so miraculous? Um, breast cancer is a disease um, uh, three, about 300,000 American women every year are diagnosed with breast cancer and about 40,000 American women die of breast cancer every year. This is a very, very common, uh, common disease. Um, so what I learned in those first couple of weeks, once I got past all of the weird facts that I learned and sort of some data that really surprised me, um, is that uh, the story of breast cancer is really the story of healthcare uh, and science more generally. Um, the other thing about breast cancer that is really interesting, I think, is that we have spent more money trying to eradicate breast cancer than any other cancer uh, in America, certainly. And I, I, I'm pretty sure I, I hedged this in the book because I was, it's very difficult to nail this down, but I think we have spent more public and private money on breast cancer than any other disease um, in, the, in the history of, um, of illness. Um, so, so much money is raised every year by private foundations and charities and spent on breast cancer science, breast cancer awareness, support for patients, and the federal government spends more on breast cancer than any other type of cancer, even though there are other cancers that um, are far more deadly. Um, so what did this tell us about how society sort of views a disease that strikes, yes, men, but mostly mothers and sisters and daughters? Um, so there's so much in the book, uh, so it's really hard to kind of um, summarize the book because there are chapters on many, many different topics within breast cancer, and there are the stories of many women in the book as well, other patients. Um, so I'll just tell you a couple of things I learned that are really foundational, and that if you take nothing away, nothing else away from this talk, you will uh, at least know these few um, facts. Uh, so one is that breast cancer is not really one disease. Um, it is a collection of different types of cancer that develop in the breasts. So there are different types of breast cancer. They are treated differently. They have different prognoses. Um, also, the old ways of treating breast cancer, um, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, this is the trifecta uh, that we have been using to treat breast cancer for decades, um, still exist and are still um, effective in many cases, but they are in, in many cases giving way to um, more targeted and more gentler uh, treatments. Um, so the experience of being a patient in the main, in the aggregate, is easier today than it has ever been. Um, stage four breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, is no longer an automatic death sentence, uh, which was a really important um, fact to explain and illustrate in the book. Um, I interviewed many women who had been uh, who had been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer more than a decade before um, I met them, um, which was really interesting. And finally, um, screening for breast cancer, those annual mammograms. Um, are helpful in some cases, um, but a really close look, and I spent two chapters of the book talking about breast cancer screening because I think it's a really important issue. Um, screening every woman with a mammogram every year beginning at 40 is in many cases not a great way um, to prevent breast cancer death, uh, which was a really important insight. Um, so in the book, I, I write a little bit about my own experience, um, what it was like as a 35 year old woman to soldier through um, treatments and illness and kind of cope with the fear and anxiety. Um, but the vast majority of the book is based on reporting. Um, so it's mostly a work of journalism with a tiny bit of memoir um, kind of thrown in, hopefully to keep you interested and keep you turning those pages. Um, but, uh, but most of the information in the book comes from um, hundreds of interviews I did for the book. I'm talking to oncologists around the country, uh, lots of researchers, patient advocates, um, and many, many other women um, who had, who had uh, or have um, breast cancer. Uh, I knew that my experience was just that. It was just my experience. I was not a typical patient um, because I was so young. The type of breast cancer with which I had been diagnosed was uh, not the most common type. Um, so I knew in order to write about the patient experience, I had to talk to lots of other patients and I did and I'm so glad that I did. Um, I traveled a bit um, for the book, which was fascinating. I um, went to Dallas to talk to the folks who run the Susan G. Komen Foundation, um, which has done a lot, obviously, to advance uh, the cause of fighting breast cancer, but also has been under fire uh, in recent years for a variety of reasons. Um, I toured a drug manufacturing facility in South San Francisco where the drug that I believe saved my life and has saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of other women um, is actually made. 
Um, I went to Chicago and spent some time with a woman whose breast cancer had spread to her brain, which was a very illuminating um, experience and we're still in touch. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the most interesting reporting experiences I had was I was able to observe a breast cancer surgery um, here in LA at UCLA, um, where I watched uh, the surgeon that had operated on me, who I think may be here tonight, um, perform the same surgery on another patient. Um, so overall, my goal with Radical was to take something scary and confusing uh, like cancer and try to explain it through story both my story, but also the larger story of how society has viewed breast cancer and responded to the disease over time. Um, in many ways, this was a very different project than other journalism that I have done, not just because it was a book, um, but because I have never written about myself before um, in journalism. I've always made the choice to not do that and instead to tell other people's stories. Um, and it was very daunting to sort of share what it was like to go through all of these experiences um, and to share my family's story as well. Um, but I think in many ways, doing this book project helped me sort of cope um, with the stress and anxiety that comes along with cancer treatment. Because as I was going through it, undergoing um, all the treatments that I had and experiencing all the emotions that one has, um, I hoped that the experience I was having could be helpful to other people. And I thought that it could be if I wrote about it. Um, so that was sort of my thinking in combining some memoir with some um, reporting. So that's kind of a basic overview of the project and the book and sort of why I wrote it and, and what message I hope it sends. Um, I really appreciate your attention. Thanks so much for listening. And I'm very excited to get to um, questions. Um, I know Rhonda has some questions and hopefully um, those of you in the audience uh, too will um, so fire away. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Actually, just listening to you talk, I had more questions. So that's exciting. Um, so I wanted to, of course, thank you for sharing this powerful journey with us. Um, and even though you said it's not a personal memoir, I think all of the personal interviews that you did made it feel even more personal. Um, and the whole time I was reading your book, it was funny, there was like something that just kept coming back to me. And it was the uh, quote from the Art of War that says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. And I just, I, I just felt like you, you did so much to know what the disease was and you did so much looking at yourself and, and looking at others who were suffering that it just made me feel that you were all the more a superwoman now. And, um, <laughs> and I'm sure, I, I hope that nothing touches you the way this has in the future. So. Um, okay, uh, we have a couple questions uh, waiting in the wings, but I'm going to ask a few as people uh, um, add more questions. And so um, the first question that everybody wants to know is how are you feeling now? Um, yes, I, I'm feeling great. Um, I'm very, very fortunate. Um, I finished my treatment in um, February of 2016. And uh, that was the last infusion that I had. Uh, the type of breast cancer that I had does not uh, require long uh, ongoing treatment. So that was the end of my treatment and I've had no signs of cancer since. So it appears as though uh, the treatment worked. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it is an interesting question though, because um, I, you know, uh, definitely thought a lot about words like survivor and being cancer free uh, when I was sort of um, going through the book. And I think the experience of having been a patient made me understand sort of the gravity and the politics around some of those terms. So what I say is I was diagnosed with breast cancer at this time, I'm doing really well and I've had no signs since. Um, and to your point, I just wanted to respond to what you said before about your quote, Rhonda, which is for me, um, I felt like knowing more helped me to feel less anxious, to fully mm -hmm. understand, but that's not the case for every cancer patient. And there were many women I interviewed who said, I don't want to know. I just want to mm -hmm. just do what my doctor says and be over with it. But for me, um, I felt like understanding more was really helpful. And, um, so I hope that people, uh, will pick up this book if they do want to know more right. um, about the experience. Right, excellent, well taken. Um, so your diagnosis took actually a month. Mm -hmm. um, is that normal? Is, is, is that typical of, of, I mean, that waiting a month must have been horrible. Yeah, it was a brutal month. Um, it was sort of, uh, no, it's not typical. Um, it was in part because I was so young and I had no family history. So there was a lot of effort to sort of confirm and reconfirm and reconfirm my diagnosis, which is 
extremely unlikely uh, that one would be diagnosed with this type of aggressive invasive breast cancer at 35 with no family history. Yeah. Um, so I had, you know, a series of tests and then, you know, another test and imaging and biopsies. And it sort of felt like the worst case scenario kept coming true, um, which, you know, it, it taught me something. And I write about this in the introduction of the book, which is that, you know, even if the statistics are on your side, um, and, uh, and probability is on your side, somebody has to be on the other side of those probabilities. And so it's possible. Um, so that was, I think, another thing that sort of, as a journalist, you know, we rely a lot on numbers and statistics and likelihood. Yeah. Um, and so that was um, really eye-opening for me, but it was a brutal month, but thankfully um, I was very fortunate that um, the, the final uh, worst case scenario in that situation did not come true, which is my breast cancer had not spread throughout my body. So I was very yeah. lucky to have stopped the process before that and then uh, to begin treatment. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that uh, one of our uh, attendees asked is, you mentioned that your mammogram missed your breast cancer. What mm -hmm. prompted you to follow up and be diagnosed? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I had, and I write about this in the book, um, and this is uh, very personal, but it's all in the book. Um, so the reason that I knew something was wrong was I had some discharge from my nipple, and this happened after I had stopped breastfeeding my daughter, and so it was odd, but I wasn't really that concerned. So I went to the doctor, they ordered a mammogram, the mammogram did not show invasive cancer, it showed maybe some specks of like a pre-cancer, but it wasn't anything anyone was too worried about. Um, and, uh, and then I had a very good doctor who said, you know, I would just feel better if we also did an MRI. Um, so that I, then I had an MRI, which showed masses. And then I had a series of, um, of biopsies. And, and this is not an incredibly uncommon experience. If you are a young woman who is premenopausal, it's unlikely that if you have invasive disease, it would be easily picked up by, uh, by a mammogram. Um, and a couple of pathologists I talked to said that trying to find breast cancer in a dense breast, which is what young women tend to have, is like finding a, trying to find a golf ball in a snowstorm. Uh, it's very difficult. So, um, so that was part of the reason the diagnosis took so long. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank God he, he, he sent you back. You yes. Know. Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, another question from the audience is, what was the hardest part of the book to write? Mm -hmm. Was it the memoir part, the science, or the reporting? Um, it was definitely the science. Um, so the memoir stuff, um, a lot of those parts of the book I wrote while I was undergoing treatment. So I kept a huge journal and tried to um, tried to sort of report on my own emotions as I was going through them. Why am I feeling this way? What does this tell me about the larger experience of how breast cancer is approached that has sort of made me feel this way or that way. Um, so much of the memoir stuff, which I was very nervous about, um, I wrote a lot of that very early. Um, and then interviewing people and telling their stories is my jam. That's what I do. And I love to do that. Um, but I read thousands of scientific medical journal articles and tried to figure out ways to, first of all, understand the science thoroughly, and then to try to figure out ways to explain that science in lay terms so that a general audience could digest the book. So that yeah. was definitely the most challenging. Yeah. Yes. Good question. And, yeah. But And one of the things that really um, stuck with me also was what, I think it was like maybe in the 1800s that women who were having a mastectomy would dress nice, would dress up. Mm -hmm. Well, you would always, back then, you would always dress nice if the doctor was coming over. <laughs> you know? um, just... Yeah, I mean, there, there are, I mean, I really did try not to hold back in the book and, um, and I didn't want to sort of scare women who had been just diagnosed and were reading the book. But at the same time, I thought, I, I always think that information is power and, and more information helps you better understand things. So there, I write about um, a case in the book of a mastectomy in the 1800s by uh, a woman who, who survived a mastectomy with no anesthesia and then wrote about it later. Um, so, uh, and yes, she did. She was wearing her Sunday best oh, the day of her surgery when the surgeon arrived. At her home. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's talk about the clinical trials. So our clinical trials are obviously so important to furthering medical research. Yes. Um, and thankfully there are people who will volunteer to be subjects, mm -hmm. um, but I imagine it is a difficult choice. And can you talk about the pros, the cons, and what makes people choose to mm -hmm. uh, be a part of one? 
Yes. So fewer than 5% of all cancer patients participate in clinical trials, which is really an impediment to research. Um, so if you are unfortunate enough to be diagnosed with cancer, um, it is uh, a great idea to sort of seek out um, an academic medical center and some, <clears throat> if you choose. And I was really very eager to be part of science because I knew that other clinical trials were the reason that the drug that I needed existed. Um, so I was offered the opportunity to enroll in a clinical trial, even though I was an early stage uh, breast cancer patients. So I think a lot of people think clinical trials are for people at the end of the line um, who have sort of no other options, but that's absolutely not the case, um, particularly when it comes to breast cancer. But it was a difficult choice. So I was enrolling in a clinical trial that was testing the standard treatment for my disease, which is very effective, against a new drug. Um, that um, earlier trials had show was, shown was probably effective. It was far less toxic. Um, than the uh, regimen I, you know, I would get otherwise. And so, and once you enroll in the clinical trial, you can always pull out, but I didn't want to do that. So it was like, you have to decide, am I willing to sort of bet my life on perhaps this experimental treatment? Um, in the end, um, I really trusted my oncologist who uh, was at UCLA and was the principal investigator for the trial. And she was one of the world, she's one of the world's experts. I was so lucky to find her um, for my type of breast cancer. And I trusted her and um, she felt confident in the trial. So I enrolled, but then I was randomized uh, to receive the standard treatment. So I got to be in the clinical trial and contribute to science, but I didn't have to um, sort of take an experimental drug. And when the results of that trial were published, the early results of that trial were published um, showed that actually the standard regimen was better. Um, so it was just one of the many ways um, that I was very fortunate. Very lucky. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Robin Crabtree uh, asked, such a beautiful and impactful book. Thanks for sharing your story. You demystify so much. Are you teaching this book in your journalism classes? And if so, how are you navigating the self-disclosure and personal vulnerability via v, your role as instructor? And how do you help students navigate the ways that they want to investigate issues with which they have personal experience? Mm, yes. Thank you for the question, Robin. Hello. Thanks for the support. Um, so I have not taught this book in my classes yet. However, um, I'm starting a new class at LMU next year um, called, uh, about, called Health and Science Journalism, uh, where I will be talking about the book. And I think part of the reason um, I haven't spoken about the book a lot in my classes is because it is so personal. And I think I'm just still trying to figure out sort of um, how to talk about it um, with my students. But I will be doing this next year in this new course. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that I learned from doing the book about journalism was I really learned the value of first person journalism, which I very rarely had done. Um, so even if you don't write about yourself, you can write about yourself in the third person when doing magazine stories, for example. I met this person here, I went to this place. Um, but I had sort of shied away from that thinking, the journalist should never be in the story. It's distracting. It's sort of, is it ego driven? Um, but doing this book um, really taught me the value of first person journalism because it's kind of really being on the level with the reader. Um, here I am the reporter. Let me take you along with me on my reporting journey where I saw it, you know, I wanted to learn this. And so I called this person and learned this. And I think it's actually more transparent in many ways. Um, so I have um, continued to do uh, in journalism that I've done since the book has come out. I've done more first person uh, sort of writing um, because of that. So I think that that is something that I have imparted to my students often. Um, and we have a class in the journalism program called Reporter in the Story um, about sort of how to write about things that you have experienced yourself and when you are a part of the story. Um, so that's a really important form of journalism that I uh, learned a lot about um, through this project and have definitely talked to my students about. Um, so Alexandra Neal asked, do you think all the money that is earmarked for breast cancer is being used in the most effective way? Of course not. <laughs> no, it's way too much money to all be used effectively, right? Um, so we're talking in the order of, you know, more than a billion dollars a year is earmarked for breast cancer. And that's probably a low estimate. Um, that's between um, NIH and federal government funding and, um, and private, uh, the big private um, foundations and charities that raise money um, for breast cancer. So there's currently a big debate going on um, about sort of where those monies um, should be directed, particularly the private money um, raised by organizations like Comen and Avon and the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. These organizations do a lot of really incredible things, um, but there is still a big focus on breast cancer awareness and education as sort of a cause. 
And we do need more awareness and education, particularly in certain communities, um, but it is not targeted. And a lot of money is spent on um, sort of a campaign that's been around for so long. Um, it's kind of like, I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post about this, um, but it's sort of like, who is not aware of breast cancer, right? We all know that it exists. So should that money be directed toward teaching people more or should it be directed toward research? Um, so Komen and some of these other organizations have in recent years directed more money in more targeted ways um, toward research, but also toward um, research for stage four breast cancer, um, research and um, funding to reduce the uh, major um, disparities in um, healthcare outcomes um, by racial groups. Um, so if you are a black woman diagnosed with breast cancer in America, you are 40% more likely to die than a, your white counterparts. And this has to do with the stage at which the cancers are diagnosed in this community, um, but also has to do with the fact that um, certain populations, Ashkenazi Jewish women and black women tend to um, be more frequently diagnosed with forms of breast cancer that are harder to treat and more aggressive. Um, so sort of really digging in kind of beyond the pink ribbon and the marches to really um, drill down on sort of where do we need to spend more money where are we still really falling short? Yeah. Interesting. Um, a question from Rachel Washburn says, thanks for your talk, Kate. Your book does such an amazing job of weaving together your personal story along with the facts you gathered about the history and science of breast cancer. Has your work on the book shaped your thinking and approach as a journalist more generally? But you have talked about changes. To do about yes, um, definitely on the first person um, aspect. And I think also, um, and if there are journalists in the audience, they will understand what I'm about to describe, which is I, I started my career as a newspaper reporter and I wanted to become a magazine reporter because I thought I never have enough time to report stories. I never really get to the bottom of things. And then I did magazine writing for a while and I was like, I have to write a book because then I'll really get to the bottom <laughs> of things. I didn't feel like I was doing it even with <laughs> cover stories and long magazines. So I thought, surely I will feel satisfied. I have learned everything. And of course, I ended the book project feeling like I could have gone on for another couple of years and another 300 pages. So I think one of the things I learned is that um, you have to do your best um, to connect the dots uh, as best as you can. But it, uh, there is always more to learn and always more uh, reporting to do. So I've continued to write about breast cancer since the book came out um, here, and, here and there, although I'm very eager to sort of tack tackle other, um, other subjects as well. But um, there are a couple of other stories about breast cancer I'd really like to do that I didn't get to do in depth enough. Um, in the book. So Rachel, I think it, you know, taught me that if the work is never done. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Robin Viscolzi asks, I could never have endured the, uni the university interview process and the in the first months of teaching under the stress you must have felt. You are such an inspiration. Mm -hmm. Was there anything in your experience as a reporter that you think may have enabled you to endure the early months of your treatment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think just the fact that I was learning so much, right? So the drug that um, that that saved my life is called Herceptin. Um, people may have heard of this drug. It's, it was a very there are very few breakthrough drugs in breast cancer history, but Herceptin is one of them. Um, and uh, and I read there was actually a book just written about Herceptin by a great um, healthcare journalist for NBC named Robert Bazell. Um, and I, so I read that book in a couple of days because I was so eager for more information and the science, he presented the science so well and it was, I felt confident in the treatment. Um, so that, and I don't think that I would have read that much and, and learned as much as I did if I hadn't been a journalist and that really helped me feel calm uh, sort of going into treatment. It was then just a matter of like day by day, let's just tick these things off and like get through this. Like I felt, um, optimistic, not confident, I wouldn't say, but optimistic that it would that it would work as advertised. Um, so that was really helpful at the beginning. And then also just that I knew early on, I would write something, whether it was a story or a book. And so, you know, like I said, at the end of my kind of early introductory talk, um, I'd hoped that this would be useful to other people, which gave me another kind of purpose um, as I was kind of going through treatment, which I think was really therapeutic and really helpful. Right. Um, so we have a question from Eric Zaro saying, what was your favorite part of writing this book? And I'm thinking you're going to say the interviews with all of the different people that you mm -hmm. did, um, because I know that was the favorite part of, my, of the book uh -huh. for me. Um, they were just fabulous, the interviews, and the Thank way you, you wove them into the stories were, I, I really encourage everybody to read it because it really does make you feel that you are a part of the story. Mm -hmm. And also um, shout out to those women who um, agreed to let me write about them um, so honestly and in a very like raw ways. 
Um, so I have kind of um, a note at the beginning of the book just to explain that there are no names have been changed. There are no composite characters, no narratives were tweaked to make the literary piece of it work better. Um, I felt really uh, committed to everything being very honest. Um, and transparent. So um, these women that are that I, that I wrote about in the book were very, very brave um, to trust me and to allow all of this personal stuff to be in this book. Um, one of the women I wrote about, for example, um, uh, I learned so much from her about what it is like to have estrogen fueled breast cancer, which is the most common type of breast cancer. It is not the kind that I had. So I had to interview a lot of women to learn what it was like. Um, and basically the treatment is to try to remove all estrogen from the patient's body, um, either through surgery, surgical removal of ovaries or hormone blocking uh, medications. Um, and we estrogen can fuel breast cancer, but it also does a lot of other great things for us, right? Like for our brains and our bones and our sex life. And this is very important. Um, and so it was, it's very difficult. It can, for some women, it can be very difficult to go through um, that treatment. And this woman in the book, Eleanor Ford, let me write about this um, and sort of what impact this had on her marriage and her uh, psychological health. Um, and uh, so I'm very grateful. And I did really enjoy writing those stories. Um, I also, though, really did like to write about some of the uh, sort of this stuff got like less attention in the reviews and things, but um, the story about that tree in the Pacific Northwest, I was, yeah, that was great. I became, I went down a real rabbit hole for like two months about that tree um, <laughs> and was just fascinated uh, with the process of this botanist discovering it in 1962 and this government program to look for cancer cures in the natural world and became very fascinated with that. And writing about the surgery that I observed was also um, a really challenging um, task and, and, and just being there and seeing the surgery, um, I got to be like right at the table um, and see everything up close. So it was, and it was not, um, it was not sort of a stomach churning experience. It was just really, really interesting. And it felt a little like Grey's Anatomy. Like the surgeons really do just like kind of chat uh, once they get, <laughs> once they get going on a, on a surgery that they've done hundreds of times before. Um, so, uh, so it was just really, really interesting. <laughs> Um, so Cassie Esparza says, how was the experience of reporting on something that you personally have been affected by different? How, did you find it more or less challenging in your prior reporting on healthcare? Um, I think it was more challenging because I knew that I was coming in with a ton of bias, right? So I had a perspective, like things had worked for me. And so I felt good about those things. Right. Um, and uh, and there were certain ways that I wanted to do things. And it seemed like that was the right way to do things. Um, and so when you, um, you know, begin a project and hi, Cassie, thanks for coming. She's one of my <laughs> students. Um, when you are, uh, you know, writing about something you are invested in, um, you have a bias. Right. Of course. Um, so trying to kind of constantly be open about that and also try to kind of silo that in some way um, was really challenging. Um, it was really difficult. And it was also a very difficult writing problem to solve to sort of try to weave memoir and like stuff about myself in with this other science, mm -hmm. because um, I love to read memoirs, but sometimes I read memoirs and I feel like they're a little self-indulgent. It's sort of like, why do I care about this person's life? Like, but in a good memoir, it's obvious, right? And you become completely sucked in and it's such a, a great form. Um, but I was very um, conscious of the fact that I, that everything that happened to me seemed really important to me um, and to try to make choices about um, what other things, what things I would include. Um, and Cassie will remember it because I say this in class all the time, journalism is, all, is about choices. And one of the choices you make is what to leave out. Um, so trying to make those choices um, was uh, was challenging. And there were a lot of things that were originally in early drafts that came out and things that were added later. Yeah. Wow. How long did it actually take you to write the book? Um, yes, I'm very grateful to LMU for a spring sabbatical in spring of 2018, <laughs> which is very helpful uh, in the summer. Um, I wrote the majority of the book in like an eight or nine month period. I spent most of the time reporting. Um, and you know, when you do, I mean, this is my first book, but um, obviously all the folks that you have in this uh, series, you know, uh, and, mm -hmm. and you know, most of the uh, tenured professors at LMU have had this experience of putting together a book project, but it's a very overwhelming um, process because you end up with so much material and um, organization is really important. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot about myself as a writer. For example, I, I learned that I really can only write well and it can be very productive at night. Um, so it took me a long time to learn that. And I would, on my sabbatical, I'd kind of sit at my desk with daylight and 
you know, uh, things happening in the world and, you know, the news on Twitter, which I'm always obsessed with churning all the time. It was really hard for me to get a lot of words out uh, during the day. So I wrote really well at night. And once I learned that uh, the, the writing came much easier and faster. Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, with I, I would have loved more time, but you always have to, you, always, you have to have an editor when you're a journalist, it tells you it's time to stop, so. <laughs> um, here at LMU, we have a support group for staff and faculty cancer survivors. Um, what do you think is the value of a group like this? And did you use a support group? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't join any groups. Um, and uh, and I felt like for a couple of reasons, and these were very personal to me and and and, and I think, by the way, let me just say, first of all, that I think support groups are amazing and wonderful. And I know that so many people get so much um, out of them. And even if you have nothing else in common with someone, if you have this diagnosis in common, you can definitely have a very deep conversation. Um, and it can be really, really helpful. For me, because I was, because of how old I was, and because of the diagnosis I had, I sort of felt like, I was nervous to talk to people who had um, sort of more deadly forms of the disease or more it were at more advanced stages. That was scary to me. And then I also felt like I didn't really want to talk to people who didn't have breast cancer as badly as I had it, because how could they understand my experience? So I got kind of caught up in this weird thing. I'm not really a joiner. Um, so for me, uh, it wasn't something I sought out. Um, however, I highly recommend uh, so for <laughs> most people uh, do do that. And it is, um, it is really helpful. And I did, I did have a couple of, uh, actually my husband's best friend's wife who was 36 was diagnosed like six months after me. So I had someone in my life who was going through a similar thing and we talked wow. and spent a lot of time together. And that was really, um, wow. was really helpful. Yeah. Gosh. Um, so you mentioned um, Robert Mazel's book, but were there other books that helped you get through the experience on a personal level, mm -hmm. not as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I mean, this is sort of like giving the same answer and over and over again, but like Emperor of All Maladies, which is Siddhartha Mukherjee's Pulitzer Prize winning um, biography of cancer, uh, which came out, I think, in 2010. It's a huge, huge book. Um, I read it when I was um, a journalist because I did a story uh, when I was at time. I did a story about cancer screening and there was and I read the book because I wanted to know a bunch of history stuff. But I read it again, um, both for research for my book, but really also because I wanted to know story, right? And I wanted to know context. Um, so that book and the Robert Bazell book um, were really helpful for me. I also, of course, went back and read um, Susan Sontag's mm. work um, and some other, um, uh, Barbara Ehrenreich has written very eloquently about um, breast cancer, about having breast cancer in cancer land and that idea. Um, but for me, I, I wasn't interest, that interested in reading. I did read a bunch of breast cancer memoirs, um, but I think more to kind of study the form. Uh, but for me personally, reading books that had story and facts uh, was mm -hmm. really helpful. That was what I wanted and sought out. Right, right. Um, Stephanie Serpente says, first, thank you for sharing your book experience and your journey. You are so inspiring and I can't wait to read your book for many reasons, but especially because of comprehensive approach you took, you have taken to the topic. As someone who is personally supporting a very close family member through ovarian cancer as we speak, this pub night is just what I needed. Hmm. Does your book discuss the role of a support network for someone who is fighting cancer? And if so, can you briefly talk about your findings of ex or experience in this area? Sorry, mm -hmm. I should have read that one instead of my question for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, uh, you're wonderful to be mm -hmm. there um, for your, uh, I think you said close family member. Um, going through this. Um, it is so important to have people in your life who are fully briefed on what you are going through, um, both because um, it is uh, very overwhelming. Like I, I had what, one of the researchers that I interviewed said, the weird thing about breast cancer is you sort of have to become an expert in your disease very quickly um, because you have to start making decisions. It's not an emergency, a breast cancer diagnosis, but it is something you need to start treating relatively soon. It's not like a chronic uh, uh, illness like diabetes or hypertension or a disease that you, you know, kind of learn and, uh, you know, develop a scientific understanding about over time with breast cancer, you're kind of hit with this diagnosis. Maybe you have a good doctor that explains like data and, you know, studies and science to you and gives you some options for sort of how you will proceed, but you have to make decisions quickly and it's very overwhelming. So for me, for example, my husband came with me to every appointment that I had um, and uh, took notes. We both took notes. Mm. He's a journalist too. So <laughs> we both took notes and we also um, recorded, um, uh, tape recorded all of the doctor consults because, and, and so this 
uh, questioner can also be helpful in that way too, because it's very easy when you're the patient for things to just, you know, you kind of glaze over and you forget things, et cetera. Um, so being there to um, both be fully briefed and help uh, someone talk through choices about treatments can be really helpful. But also it's just so great to have people who know you that you can be honest with when you are going through cancer treatment. And cancer will kind of teach you, um, you know, who your friends are, right? So any cancer, any person diagnosed with cancer will be surprised by some people that will um, not show up and sort of not be around and then other people that will just be amazing. Um, so a support network of friends and family who understand your illness and what you're going through is I think really critical because it helps you make better decisions to be able to talk things through with someone else. It's more than just about hugs, although those are important too. <laughs> yes. um, one of the questions that, uh, that came up in our in the outreach department was uh, kind of interesting. It was, in your research, have you come across this conspiracy idea that mm -hmm. the cure for cancer was found long ago, mm -hmm. but that the cure is being suppressed? Mm -hmm. How do you respond to this? And is it worth responding at all to? It's very important to respond to this um, and to say that that is not true. Um, and uh, and there are, uh, there's a lot of, and I'm, I kind of thought about doing a book about this, but I just don't know if I can do another cancer book. Um, but there's a whole world of kind of um, alternative medicine and alternative treatments uh, for cancer um, that I personally think is very, is quite dangerous. Um, and uh, this idea that there is a conspiracy between big pharma and the government to sort of conceal um, natural and easy cures for cancer is I think a really dangerous um, dangerous notion. One of the reasons I wanted to write about that tree that uh, <laughs> it was where the chemotherapy drug came from is was to show that actually there's no aversion uh, to, to nature. And in fact, the uh, one of the other major um, chemotherapy drugs used in breast cancer came from a bacteria uh, that was discovered in Italy uh, in the 1800s. So there, um, so this idea that uh, this is all chemical um, is not quite right. And then also the federal government spends so much money treating cancer through Medicare and Medicaid subsidies for the uh, for Obamacare now that if the, if there was a cheap <laughs> cure for cancer the federal government would love to do that and to know <laughs> about that um, and to push that forward so that idea kind of doesn't make a lot of sense if you start to uh, sort of poke it I do want to say one thing though I'm talking about alternative treatments to cancer this idea that people may um, uh, do you know vitamin supplements or change their diet uh, instead of um, traditional mm -hmm. cancer treatments. What I'm not talking about is complementary medicine, which is sort of um, oftentimes Eastern uh, medicine and other things that you can do uh, like meditation and yoga and other things that you can add to your conventional treatment to make the experience better. That's right. great. UCLA and major cancer centers almost all have integrative or complementary um, medicine as a part of their cancer programs. And that's very important. Uh, what I'm talking about is if people decide to forego traditional treatment in favor of, of other things that don't have good scientific data behind right. it. Right, right. Um, Cam Dahlquist said, are you familiar with the book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer? Did you look into environmental causes of cancer? Uh, so I did, I'm not familiar with this book, um, although I have a bookshelf that I can see that has like about a hundred books of cancer <laughs> and breast cancer. So I looked and read a lot of them and that it may not be coming to mind, but yes, of course. Um, so, uh, I have a, a half a chapter is about the sort of search for environmental causes of breast cancer, because there is some environmental component. Um, and any good research oncologist would tell you that it's just not understood what these things are. And it's very difficult to figure out what they are, right? These kinds of longitudinal studies are what's necessary to figure this out. And they're very, very hard to do because our environment is full of so many things from our in utero environment to what we eat, to what's in the air and what's around us in plastic, like everything, right? The environment in includes so many different things, but it's very uh, difficult research to do. But there are some clues um, as to, uh, for example, um, women in Japan have lower rates of um, breast cancer, um, but uh, Japanese women who immigrate to the United States within a generation or two, uh, their offspring have uh, the same breast cancer rates as other American women. So why is this? 
what is different about the environment or the diet here. So there have been studies about, for example, green tea and olive oil and all these things. There have been there has been research on this. We could do more research on it, um, but it's 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 kind of a research question that um, may be um, impossible to solve. It would be great if we could figure out what causes all kinds of cancers, right? Um, like with mm -hmm. cervical cancer, we learned that this was actually caused by a virus, and now we have a vaccine. How wonderful! <laughs> um, if it was that easy for breast cancer, I think we would have um, we would have discovered it already. But I do. Um, I, there are environmental causes, um, but we just don't have a lot of good science on what those might be. So um, Paul Harris asks, thank you for your amazing book, which I wish my mother could have read. She passed away from lung issues that possibly originated from chemo for breast cancer. Hmm. Is there research about the long-term consequences of such treatments? Yes, um, because in part, there are so many breast cancer patients to study. Uh, there are about 3 million um, people in America who have been treated, been diagnosed and treated for, uh, for breast cancer. Um, I'm not aware of what, um, and hi Paul, um, of, uh, of um, uh, that type of uh, long-term impact from radiation, although radiation therapy has come a long way. Um, and I don't know, uh, Paul, when your mom uh, was treated, but it used to be that radiation therapy um, left patients with a lot of heart damage particularly if they had left side breast cancer um, and lung damage. And they've gotten really a, a lot better at delivering um, radiation. Radiation is a very effective um, way of treating uh, cancer, by the way. Um, and it's not as bad or as scary as you might think when you hear the word radiation. It was the easiest part of my treatment. Um, but, uh, but they have gotten a lot better at sort of targeting radiation with smaller doses and still getting the same, um, the same outcomes. Um, so it's a, it's a good question um, and something that also is need of uh, much further study, I think. The long-term impacts, yes. Yeah. So um, another question that that I'm very curious about is um, celebrities get diseases all the time, mm -hmm. and it seems like the ones that we remember, at least I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm a woman, but are the ones that are from breast cancer. Mm -hmm. We think of you know Angelina Jolie, we think of Robin Roberts, mm -hmm. uh, Betty Ford. Mm -hmm. Um, why, why does that, do they seem to have more notoriety mm -hmm. or long lasting this? It's others. a great question. And I really wanted to dig into this deeply in my book. And I interviewed a couple of celebrities who had had breast cancer, but in the end, none, neither I talked to two, um, they did not want to be, um, uh, written about. Uh, in, in a deeper way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we see, right? Like I have Melissa Etheridge in that slide. We think of Angelina Jolie who never had cancer. She had the cancer right. breast cancer gene, right? right? But we think of her, um, not just Betty Ford, but Nancy Reagan, um, Happy Rockefeller. Um, there are obviously uh, uh, Olivia Newton-John, um, you know, just tons of um, celebrities. I think we hear about this because of um, really admirable efforts, um, especially in the 90s. Um, by a lot of these breast cancer organizations and activists to really bring the disease sort of out of the shadows and reduce stigma. And I think that was a really successful effort, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that the pink ribbon is maybe the most ubiquitous and recognizable health symbol in the history of public health in the entire world, um, I think is um, tribute to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and Nancy Reagan and, and Betty Ford in particular going public, uh, Shirley Temple, uh, who, had, right. uh, who had breast cancer. These, these women who went public with this disease early on in the, in the, in the seventies really did a lot mm -hmm. um, to sort of advance, um, advance that. So I think it's a very, I, I call it in the book, the most public of all of the cancers. Um, and I think this is true. I think also um, the fact that the disease is, is, um, is common and people are open about it means, uh, you know, celebrities may be less nervous uh, to disclose this and to talk about it. And there's also, of course, this like, um, there are a lot of war metaphors in cancer, right? This like survivor who battled it and survived. Like there's a real kind of like hero narrative and story that can oftentimes go along with that, mm -hmm. um, that maybe is, um, you know, ready-made for uh, sort of quick journalism um, about it and stories. Um, and stories like that. And I think also, I think the fact that this is a disease that is, I mean, as I said, men do get breast cancer, but 99.8% of breast cancer cases are women. Um, mm -hmm. You get breast cancer because you are a woman. Um, right. And so this aspect of the disease, I think is, um, is, is just very powerful. The idea that it's, like I said, mothers and sisters and daughters and people that we can sort of relate to on that plane, I think is, is perhaps part of 
part of the reason. But yeah, you don't hear about the celebrity, all the celebrities that have heart disease. There are lots of them, right? <laughs> or, um, or celebrities who have colorectal cancer, which is mm -hmm. a very deadly type of cancer. Um, and you don't hear about that. You don't hear much about um, male actors who have prostate cancer, which is, right. um, which is a big killer. Um, but yeah, for, for some reason, breast cancer. Um, so I think this has been good in sort of destigmatizing the disease, but I think also there's been a downside, which is the experience of breast cancer has been, I think, kind of reduced to this sort of generic story that's always the same. You get breast cancer, you have chemo, you go bald, you like lose your sense of femininity and then you survive and come out the other side with like a mm -hmm. pink ribbon. And like, it's a very different experience for, um, for everyone. And, um, and there's so much more to it, uh, which is, you know, what's a right. good circle back to like sort of why I wanted right. to do the book in the first place. Right. Um, so I think we have one more question from uh, Kai Henderson says, does the enormous amount of money spent on treating and studying breast cancer also result in information and insights that aid in the treatment of other cancers? Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, for example, Herceptin, uh, which was a drug developed for breast cancer is now used, I believe in gastric cancer um, and some other cancers. And as we are learning more just about what cancer is, there's so much that scientists and doctors do not understand about cancer. It's just an, an insane amount. Um, and, and I say in the book, we will look back on sort of how we are treating cancer now in horror at some point and be like, oh my gosh, all these assumptions that we had that were wrong. Um, so, uh, so as we are learning more about cancer, we're learning um, uh, something really important, which is that um, the type of breast cancer I had, for example, may have uh, more in common with a stomach cancer than with another type of breast cancer. So what does this mean for sort of how we think about treatment? So the design for clinical trials is changing and evolving and getting better. So there are clinical trials where people with all different kinds of cancer might be in a clinical trial testing one drug against all these different types of cancer. Um, so that is uh, uh, amazing. And breast cancer, because so much money is invested in it, there are so many trials. I think uh, when I wrote the book, there were like almost 2000 ongoing uh, clinical wow. trials enrolling people at the time that I wrote the book. And I'm sure it's more or the same now. Um, there's so many trials, there's so much science for breast cancer that we have learned so many lessons um, that have improved um, treatments um, for other types of cancer. For example, breast cancer, for a long time, doctors didn't know that it was related to hormones at all. This was a huge revelation. Um, and of course, there are lots of other uh, cancers that are also related to um, hormonal changes. Um, so that's mm -hmm. another insight. So yes, absolutely. The money spent on breast cancer is good for not just breast cancer patients, but for, for all cancer patients in direct and indirect ways. Excellent. Well, it's uh, it's past our time to go, but okay. this is so fascinating. I, I, I so enjoyed reading your book and I so love listening to you. Thank you so much uh, for coming to Faculty Pub Night. I really appreciate it. And it's so important for all of us to understand the critical need to be more aware of our bodies mm -hmm. and to be more aware of our options. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much, uh, Kate Pickard. And, um, we also, of course, always want to thank our Dean, Christine Brancolini, for her continual support of the faculty of the Hannon Library's um, fabulous programming that we do all year. Um, thank you for you all for coming tonight. I hope you will all join us next month on Tuesday, March 16th at 5 p.m. when we will feature Dr. Anya O'Healy, who will be discussing her book, Migrant Anxieties, Italian Cinema in a Transnational Frame. So um, thank you all again for coming and thank you again, Kate. And last but not least, please take time to fill out a very, very short survey that will pop up once you leave the program as it will help us plan and improve our future for programming. So thank you everybody and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Thanks everyone for the great questions. Thank you.